we'll move on to public uh, participation and invite um, Imagination Station Sam Butcher to come forward. Thank you. Uh, tēnā koutou and uh, good morning. It's wonderful to be here with you all and thank you for having me this morning. Uh, for those I haven't had the chance to meet personally, uh, kia ora, my name is Sam Butcher and I have the privilege of running Imagination Station, which is a charity running social enterprise Lego education and uh, we do that in conjunction with the city libraries and other entities around the city and um, it's just wonderful to, to have that opportunity. I wanted to come this morning for two reasons. Firstly, to thank you all for your support throughout the last year. And secondly, to share with you some of the successes that we've been able to have in light of the challenges that there have been this year. So firstly, I simply want to recognise and thank this council for your support this year through director's fees and through the discretionary response fund that have enabled us to maintain and develop our offerings at Tōranga and beyond around Christchurch. So on behalf of my team and on behalf of Christchurch, thank you for that support. Uh, you have enabled us to thrive. And I think it's important that this council is proud of what you have enabled us to do because of your support. I think it's important to note that this support has not only been at a financial level, but also through excellent relationships that we've been able to have with a number of different council staff. So thank you very much for that. Our organisation, much like this council, believes that community partnership is the best way to find the best outcomes. And we believe that our relationship with this council is a testament to that in action. Imagination Station's agility as a, smart, as a small grassroots social enterprise has given us the ability to do a huge amount of good for our community with a relatively minuscule budget. And so once again, thanks for supporting us as we support tens of thousands of Christchurch kids and families. Secondly, I wanted to briefly share with you several highlights of our work over the last year. As a number of you are aware, in January we launched our mobile education van, which enables us to take our courses to schools around Christchurch and also make the most of other community spaces around the city, including other community libraries. Uh, thanks to this initiative, we have been able to run holiday courses at South Library and New Brighton. We've even launched a weekly after school class in New Brighton, which has been very well received. And we are excited to also be offering a new after school class in South Library in term one next year. And so it's very exciting to be expanding that horizon. And it's exciting for those communities as well that we're able to tap into and offer more opportunities in this space. Uh, this year we also launched our very first girls only after school class, which enables young girls to engage with science and technology in a safe and encouraging environment of like-minded girls, which is much needed in the current environment, uh, given that a lot of these industries can typically be quite male dominated, so providing opportunities for them to really engage in a safe space has been very well received. Lastly, over the last couple of years, we've had the privilege of working with the University of Canterbury and also with the library's education team to offer science and technology courses for homework clubs on the east side of the city. <coughs> with the support of Ministry of Pacific Peoples, these courses have been a huge success and we're continuing to grow these over the coming years as we look at adding additional levels to really upskill those communities. So we're looking forward to working on that partnership as we go forward as well. These are just a few of the highlights we've had over the last year or so, and we hope that you are all encouraged by the work that we're doing. I am aware that there are several conversations happening at the moment about how we might partner with this council at a longer term level, and I look forward to seeing the outcomes of these conversations over the coming months as well. So I have tried to keep this very brief as an update. I'm aware there's a lot going on this morning, but uh, thank you all for your time, and uh, I hope that you have some time to digest this information as you are uh, kind of carry on in your meeting. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. It's, it's very much appreciated that you've come and given us an update. We're, we're just thrilled with um, what we see happening in, in Tūranga in particular, but we know that through your presentation that you take it out into the wider community. So keep the imagination going for our young people. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Um, 
The next one is, uh, these are all deputations by appointment, so they're in relation to specific items on the agenda. Um, so I'd like to invite the Cancer Society and Community and Public Health uh, from the CDHB to talk to item 21, amendment to smoke-free public places policy. And we've got um, Amanda Dodd and uh, Lee Tuki. Thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa he mahi nui ki a koutou tēnā i ata. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Lee Tutuki Tifu, tifu Tifaru Tuku Ingoa, and I'm here with Amanda Dodd from the Cancer Society, and we're both members of Smoke Free Canterbury. So we'd like to thank you for the opportunity to support the paper encouraging smoke free public policies places policy. Yesterday, regulations came into effect seeking to increase the range of controls on vaping products, aiming to prevent the normalisation of vaping and to protect young people from marketing and promotions of vaping products. In alignment with the purpose of legislation, we encourage Council to extend the current smoke-free policy and endorse the inclusion of vaping. Over the past few years, you would have noticed huge media um, attention to vaping, and without effective regulations, the vaping market has expanded rapidly, with many vaping products available in New Zealand. A briefing sheet has been made available to all of you um, councillors and to avoid us going into too much detail about the vaping products, um, I'd like to hand over now to Amanda to talk to you about the health impacts of vaping. Tēnā koutou katoa, councillors. So whilst we acknowledge that vaping can indeed help some people quit smoking and that vaping is less harmful than tobacco, we are aware that it is not entirely harmless. Vaping products are not meant to be lifestyle products, but are solely for use in supporting people to stop smoking. The Ministry of Health advice is only vape to quit smoking, and if you don't smoke, don't vape. There has been much concern voiced nationally by our school leaders via the Principals Association of New Zealand about the significant increase of young people vaping. A likely contributor to this will have been the, up until now, unregulated promotions that have really excessively targeted young people. A recent New Zealand study, the Youth 19 survey, actually found that 40% of regular vapors, of regular young vapors, had never indeed smoked cigarettes and were new entrants to the, vipotine, the vaping and then nicotine market. We need to be aware that some vaping products have exceptionally <coughs> high levels of nicotine, which does affect cognitive development, particularly during that vulnerable adolescence time. The long-term health impact of vaping is unknown at this stage. But we do know that many of the products contain significant toxicants, which have shown associations with respiratory diseases like asthma and lung disease. And this has really caused enough concern for key organisations like the World Health Organisation and our own, Cancer Society of New Zealand, to call for a cautious approach to electronic nicotine delivery systems. So as Lee indicated at the start of this presentation, including vaping is entirely consistent with one of the key purposes of the new Act which is to prevent young people from initiating smoking and to prevent the normalisation of vaping in our communities. It is consistent with Council's own smoke-free policy to reduce exposure to toxicants in public places. And the Fresh Air project, which Council has supported and endorsed since its inception, has proven that smoke-free and vape-free spaces in outdoor areas are acceptable to the public as the public become more concerned about the health impacts and the environmental damage from litter. We should also remember that most people are respectful of restrictions, these kinds of restrictions, in shared public places. 
Including vaping also would reduce any ambiguity, so it makes consistent messaging and is less confusing to the public. Also to bear in mind, as the report, which will be tabled later in this meeting, sets out there are many councils who have introduced and included vaping into their smoke-free public places policy for similar reasons outlined here. In relation to the environment, including vaping would help and contribute to reducing environmental impact of tobacco litter and vaping litter. And this really does align to the impact and the aspirations of stewardship of the land. Also contributes to your outcome, safe and healthy communities. So when we look at reviewing the smoke-free public policy places, policy, um, this really does give us an opportunity to look forward and look at the potential to expand smoke-free public spaces. Smoke-free policies are, have proven to be acceptable to the public and more and more people are concerned about health impacts and environmental impacts. Indeed, Council's own consumer survey showed strong support for including vaping in the smoke-free policy. And if we look and we take this um, graphic here, this, these are key findings from a six-month trial in Hamner Springs Village, which was a smoke-free, vape-free zone. And that shows that nine out of 10 visitors, seven out of 10 residents, and six out of 10 businesses endorsed the retention of that smoke-free, vape-free zone as a permanent feature for the village. That was then actually endorsed by Hurunui District Council to become a permanent feature for Hamner Springs. So good signage with consistent and positive communications would support the policy and signage can be rolled out as part of the renewals process for council, including new developments as they become operational. We would also like to ask for council support for Smoke Free Canterbury members to work with council staff and the business community to explore the potential to widen smoke free public spaces for Christchurch City. I'll now hand back for Lee for closing comments. Thank you, Amanda. We'd like to acknowledge the strong leadership of Council and the Smoke Free over the years with many anchor projects like the Health Precinct with Embracing Smoke Free. Let's be ambitious about health and wellbeing for all of our people as we are about the growth and development of our city. The two concepts can coexist. Smoke Free, Vape Free spaces support equity by linking people to behavioural support to quit smoking, whilst limiting the exposure of smoke -free smoking and vaping behaviours for non-smokers. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you for your time, and we're happy to answer any questions now. We have a couple of minutes, so um, just um, thank you for your presentation. I, um, because I have no real knowledge of vaping, um, I guess the issue that you've raised that I wasn't so aware of uh, was the um, disposing of the waste products. I never even thought of them as having waste products, but um, can you describe what sort of problem that creates for us? Because I mean, that is an issue on beaches and, and the different places where we currently prohibit smoking and would extend this to. Absolutely, there's more and more concerns from the public health field about the environmental impact. And as you know, you've got very strong public support for, for cleaner, greener spaces for Christchurch City. Um, basically, in essence, toxicants can leak into water systems, um, obviously in terms of air, quality that that is a factor but a lot of tobacco cigarettes and vaping products actually use a lot of plastics so that that's another issue that we that we need to be concerned of thank you do we have any other questions uh tom It's now going. The smoke-free signs that we've got throughout our sports fields, etc. I mean, the re it's been outstanding. Everyone's taken that up, and it's um, you know, if anyone ever did turn up with a cigarette, you know, like the, the dirty looks you get, it just doesn't work, which is fantastic. With the upgrade, though, of all our signage to include vaping, is there a possibility that that you, you guys can assist us with that? Because there is a cost to that, and there's no, for me, there's no question that it's a good good thing to do. But it does take time to do. But if, yep. if you could assist us as a council with the finance to do that in some way, shape, or form to assist in the speed of that would be really good. 
Well, there, um, that's a really good question. There are some free signs available, but they're limited number. And we had thought about that as you um, uh, have a plan to replace current signs, then that would be the, the best opportunity to include that. So using the free signs in the hotspots in the interim would be you know, a really good start, and that would be at no cost. Yep. That's very good. Well, that brings us to the and end of your I have brought pop, a prop with me today oh, just, just um, to give you some th some thoughts about signage. But we have worked with Ashburton District Council, who have included vaping in their policy, um, to make sure that the signage was available at all the public spaces. So we do have Kent Society and Community and Public Health have developed our own signage interim before the national signs become available. So that could be mm. a potential for council. Great. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we move on to um, item 22, South Shore and South New Brighton Earthquake Legacy Project. And if I could invite the South Shore Residents Association, uh, Meg Ralston and uh, Simon Watts, please. Good morning and welcome. Hi. Good morning. Kia ora Madam Mayor, Councillors, um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm Meg Rolston and this is Simon Watts. We're here representing South Shore Residents Association and we're speaking um, only in regard to the South Shore part of, of the report in front of you. Uh, we emailed extensive notes um, regarding the staff report and as we've only got 10 minutes we will um, We'll take that email as read and I'll just summarise the points today. This has been a long journey for South Shore community. We've lived with the effects of the earthquake damage to our estuary edge, the agency withdrawal, the rubble the, and the lack of repairs for over nine years. The process for this beautiful and connected community has been arduous. Dr John Cook, a GP in New Brighton, eloquently said in his deputation in May last year, when Regenerate Christchurch withdrew from the area, that the continued uncertainty around the management of equity and safety and the future of the community in South Shore and South Brighton has led many residents to dark and unhealthy places. The earthquake ruptured our village. Your decision corrodes our soul, our ground, continues to shake as we and our families grow old. I want you to bring humanity to the estuary edge we live by. We need you to resolve our fate so in peace in our land we can lie. South Shore Residents Association are pleased to finally have before you today a resolution to fund and complete these earthquake legacy repairs. We support the recommended unit approach repair, repair strategy with the view that it is an ecologically appropriate erosion and inundation solution to resolve the earthquake legacy issues of the estuary edge. The Residents Association want to be very clear, we do not support the priority repair approach. We also support the recommended new engineered bund to 11.4 metres at the current Linz bund position. The acceptance prioritise funding and implementation of both the unit approach repair and the new bund by council will create a platform for future sea level, coastal sea level rise and adaptation discussions. We believe implementing the unit approach repair and the new bund will increase the well-being of our South Shore community and enhance the amenity value of this ecologically and aesthetically valuable area for all the city to enjoy. We ask that you add a note to the resolution that specifically prioritises funding for this project be made available under the 2021 annual plan rather than just the long-term plan. The South Shore Residents Association would like to thank the project staff Gary Teer, our community representative expert, and Derek Todd at Jacobs for the extensive work done and the positive outcome achieved. We thank our community board members and area councillors, both past and present, for the support that has contributed to where we stand today. 
Lastly, but most importantly, we thank our wonderful community of South Shore for being supportive and tirelessly patient. Today, we ask you all councillors to support the recommended unit approach and the 11.4 metre bund that, and that you recommend that funding be made available for implementation of the Estuary Edge earthquake legacy repair in 2020 and urgently prioritise as per the 2019 resolution you already agreed. So that now in peace in our land we can lie. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any <laughs> Do we have any questions? James. I, I don't uh, I'll try and phrase this as as a question. So I'll do it in te reo uh, ka, ka aroha ki a koutou ki te community uh, or South Shore. Um, so can I just confirm what you do not support in this paper, in that paper? Uh, the report set out two potential strategies, but they have only recommended the unit approach, I see what and so we, yeah. we want to make it clear that that is the approach that um, we support. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, we support the officer's recommendation. Yeah. Okay. And then the other thing is, uh, are you aware, and you made a request about the, the uh, budget being in the 2021 year? The uh, annual plan as opposed to the focus the on the LTP, LTP yeah. which is the you long term You mean for next plan. year, of course. It, it means for next year. Next year, yeah. not this year. Yeah. This year. So yeah. you're aware that the timing is not quite right for the years that you mentioned, but we're, we're going to give it due yeah. consideration. I okay. guess we um, put yeah. that in because that was in the original resolution oh, and right. it didn't happen yeah. and we're hoping that it will. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. So, but that, that is a question we can ask of staff when we get staff here for the consideration of the paper itself. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Kia ora. Are there any other questions? No? Oh, look, thank you very much for... Um, do, was there something further you wanted to say? Uh, simply that we are talking about the South Shore. Yeah. Pardon. No, I, we, we understand that, and we've had some uh, correspondence from the South New Brighton ones as mm. well, which we'll address, obviously, when we get to the paper as well. Um, we... Um, yeah, but I, I just wanted to say thank you. I just think, um, you know, I made a comment yesterday in relation to the... Uh, uh, the coastal adaptation um, approach that, that we adopted with the establishment of the working group and um, you know I said it just felt so different from 2016 or 2015 whenever it was um, when we started off uh, that element of the coastal hazards chapter which mm. uh, you know was was a very challenging and difficult space for everyone uh, concerned. Supporting this will go a long way in our community. Too. I know <laughs> and, and I think that I think that um, today is going to feel quite different from previous times where we've <coughs> tried to resolve some of these issues because I think it's important to get that um, proverbial and actual line in the sand um, in terms of a way to move forward on, on other matters as well. So thank you very much for your hard work and for your presentation today. And I just did want to comment on how excellent it was to bring in the external yeah. um, support of Gary Tier. It was useful. Um, thank you. Thanks. You too. Uh, right, now we move on to item 13, which is the Cranford Street, Inners Road, Berwick Street improvements, and uh, the first up is uh, Duncan Webb, local Member of Parliament. Thank you. Kia ora koutou katoa. Sit my microphone. Kia ora koutou katoa, and look, thank you very much for um, allowing me to present. It is, it is a real privilege uh, to be here. And you'll be aware that in terms of the um, community of St Albans and Marahau, this, this is a really significant issue. Um, and I, I hope I won't take too long because it's really just a few 
brief points that I want to make. Um, and I did circulate uh, these uh, PowerPoint slides earlier. Yes, it's just gone onto the hub, so if people want to pull it up, that, that it's there. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and obviously this is about the downstream effects of the Northern Corridor. And as noted in the agenda items, it's really about how we use the additional lane space on Cranford Street um, from Innes Road to uh, Berwick Street. Um, and I really want us to focus on what principles we are applying here uh, and what weighting we should be giving them. Um, and there's one on that list where I haven't really got that I did want to add, and that is our partnership, our really important partnership um, with Waimakariri District Council um, and also with ECAN around public transport. And I, I think that's probably something that should go into the mix as well. Um, but here we have um, those principles that I'd really like us to hold at the forefront of our mind. And I put uh, the reduction of carbon emissions at the top um, for a very good reason. That is the largest challenge uh, that we've got facing us in New Zealand and around the world today. Um, but equally protecting our, our living environment, our residential areas and so on. Um, and also putting public transport as a priority, as a form of transport that's the most accessible to the most number of people. Um, and of course, um, cycling and other forms of transport, making those corridors um, cyclable, but also pleasant um, and effective to walk down as well, um, and effective and safe travel. And then I've just noted that we do have a perhaps somewhat outdated, but nevertheless it is our uh, strategic plan from 2012, um, and it, it identifies those items there. And in the text of it, I'm sure you're familiar with it, it does talk about environmental enhancements, talks about carbon emissions there, pro perhaps not with the headline that it would have uh, today, but it is still in there as a very important um, factor that we need to emphasise. And then, um, because everybody likes pictures, really just trying to set the scene of the choice that's here in front of us. You know, um, Waimakariri has made some hard decisions around how to manage um, and how to utilise uh, the Northern Corridor. Um, it's imposed rates increases on its residents so that it can have that uh, express bus service. Um, and here we have, of course, the fact that this council has declared a climate emergency. And I guess I'm urging this council to put its money where its mouth is uh, in terms of how it addresses, addresses those issues. Um, and look, uh, I want to make it clear that this is really a schematic, um, but I want us to think about what each decision might do. So the first line there is a high occupancy vehicle lane, um, which might be full time, including buses, cycles and high occupancy vehicles, and ask the question of what it actually would do. Now those I was going to play around with the little ticks and big ticks in terms of the weighting. So there's no real weighting around there, but it was beyond me. But what it does show you is what we're achieving. Um, and you can see that uh, a high occupancy vehicle lane would encourage the use of public transport. It would lower the use of single occupancy vehicles, or conversely increase the use of multi-occupancy vehicles. It would lower carbon emissions. It would reduce tra traffic. It would ease congestion. Um, it also would link up, and I think this is important, it would link up with what's going on on the Northern Corridor itself, which has a high occupancy vehicle lane. Um, and the one thing that, look, I admit my community is interested in, it wouldn't preserve parking if it was uh, a full-time um, arrangement. So some parks or a number of park and parking amenities would be lost on Cranford Street. So that's one option that's under consideration, um, and one which I think would be a, a good decision. Another good decision would be a bus and cycle priority lane in peak time, um, and obviously that has some um, alternatives in the sense that that parking would become available um, when it wasn't being used. Uh, and certainly I accept that for some businesses down Cranford Street, particularly on the Westminster intersection, uh, that would be interesting um, and, 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 and attractive, um, but it, it is a different traffic management uh, approach than that which is on the Northern Arterial. Um, now, I want to recognise the work that the community board's done um, and the voluminous submissions that were put in front of them and that they worked through um, assiduously. Um, 
but having said that, uh, their approach of which is I've called it do nothing, um, but perhaps would be more honestly called wait and see, um, really d has very little benefit at all. Um, and of course, the other downside of it is that it would um, possibly see us leave the traffic management as it is and then change it again, which is confusing for drivers and residents and so on, have a lead in period, and of course require not a huge cost, but some cost in changing the traffic management plan. So doing nothing has very modest effects, if any. Um, it's it's uh, certainly not going to assist us in reducing uh, emissions and in increasing the use of public transport or any of those other objectives that we want. Probably, however, the worst of all, of all possible worlds would be a clear way, and this is whilst it gets an extra tick, the fact of the matter is that all that a clear way would do would be to encourage more traffic. And that must be the opposite of what we really want. And we know that whilst it might ease congestion in the short term, the fact of the matter is that if you create roads, cars will come. Um, and so it would, in fact, uh, the, any easing of congestion would be in the short term. Um, it would do the opposite of uh, lessen traffic, it would in fact increase traffic, and that's something which I hope this council is, you know, strategically opposed to. So look, I think it's clear um, that if we want to address some of the big challenges that face us in terms of moving people effectively and safely in large numbers, in terms of reducing emissions, in terms of preserving our communities, uh, those top two options are by, by far and away uh, the better ones. I'm, you know, in some ways I think a high occupancy vehicle is the better of the two, but I'm, I'm relatively agnostic between the, the th those. In terms of doing nothing or putting a clear way, that would be a really a retrograde step, given the fact that these are you know, real challenges um, that face us in terms of the community today. Um, I promised I'd be short. Um, that really is uh, all I've got to say today. Just in terms of the degree of agnostic um, approach to the first two, uh, wouldn't it be more in line with what uh, the, the, the goals are to um, prioritise um, buses? Yeah, I can see that. So the advantage of uh, the bus and cycle lane is, is exactly that. It's, and, and I absolutely endorse a focus on public transport. On the other hand, a but high it, occupancy... It ties in with what why Makariri have already done, surely, and that they've they've gone out and consulted with their community, and 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 very courageously um, proceeded with the park and ride option, uh, in order to support it. We've got the express bus buses being provided by ECAN. So, on that basis, wouldn't you think that the third leg of the treble was the preferential treatment of buses. And it was lovely to see you at the races. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get a table. But you look like, look, I, I, I'm not going to fight you on this one. I mean, the high occupancy vehicle lane educates drivers about filling up cars as well, so it has some merit. Um, but I, I can entirely see a bus priority lane as being a very good outcome. Right. Um, yeah. OK, good. Any other questions? No? Good. Look, thank you Fiona, very thank much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, the ne next one is uh, Waka Kotahi, New Zealand Transport Agency. Michael Bly, Levin. Uh, kia ora, everyone. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Waka Kotahi is the New Zealand Transport Agency and we are a partner and co-investor with Christchurch City Council in the Christchurch Northern Corridor improvements. Um, that project has introduced 10 kilometres of high occupancy vehicle lanes uh, coming into the city and 15 kilometres of separated cycle paths. Um, those are there to encourage mode shift from single occupant vehicles. Um, in parallel, we are working with Environment Canterbury on improving the bus services uh, to support that and with all of our Greater Christchurch partners to encourage travel behaviour change to move more people and fewer vehicles. Mm. But change takes time and in the meantime, we've still got a lot of traffic on our arterial roads. Mm. And um, 
if we don't manage those roads appropriately, we run the risk that traffic starts to reroute and run through our local communities. She does not agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that bad. <laughs> And, and that rat running is the exact uh, effect and issue that the Environment Court recognised uh, when it set its consent conditions for the extension of the Northern Arterial and the Cranford Street improvements. And that required our Council to investigate the downstream effects management plan. Um, to recap, the, the Environment Court did note that the Council had deemed the, C, uh, the, the CNC necessary. Uh, to deliver a wide range of outcomes for the urban form, shape and growth of northern Christchurch and Waimakariri um, to, to move the traffic off uh, Main North Road in Belfast enabled um, a significant improvement in that urban space. Um, but it did also note that any additional traffic uh, may have an adverse effect on residents and businesses in the immediate area, hence referred to as the downstream effects. Uh, so what uh, was required of the downstream effects management plan uh, was to, for council to identify the preferred vehicle route um, such that uh, traffic was kept off other um, public transport corridors and cycling corridors. And that in essence reinforces the network management approach that we are jointly uh, working to where we have identified Main North Road and Papua Nui Road as our preferred public transport route with the priority measures that we've put down there. Uh, the major cycle routes are running down uh, Rutland Street and Cranford Street is the traffic route as identified by the arterial status in the Christchurch City Plan. Um, so in the, the Environment Court's consent conditions, uh, stated that the downstream effects management plan needed to manage traffic on Cranford Street such that it used the corridor rather than rerouting through those local neighbourhoods. And the target set was such that no more than 30% increase on those local streets was to occur. And that was to uh, be explored and mitigation measures identified from opening through to a commissioning period of 10 years. Um, in December, uh, and what, what the condition also required was because of the complex urban nature of this environment, they requested council to engage an independent expert traffic uh, engineer to come up with the mitigation plan. Um, and they were, uh, did refer to clearways um, traffic calming measures, speed measures, um, for which the expert uh, uh, witness or the expert advisor uh, confirmed. And in December 2019, the Christchurch City Council approached Waka Kotahi for co-investment to implement those recommended improvements. And it was on the basis of including a clearway that can be managed uh, appropriately, uh, that Waka Kotahi approved that funding. Uh, that funding also included the addition of a cycle connection from the Christchurch Northern Corridor through to uh, the major cycle route on Rutland Street, and that was our expectation. So it was uh, somewhat surprising uh, to see the community board recommending a change in scope to council that you'll be considering later today. Um, we believe that that is uh, potentially contrary to the advice of the independent expert uh, and uh, has a high likelihood uh, that you will get rat running through those local communities. In particular, the, the tricky constraint on this corridor is the traffic signal intersection at Innes Road. And the issue, the constraint that that has is where two lanes of traffic merge suddenly into one lane and that's what causes uh, the back load of traffic further up Cranford Street. And human nature is such that if I see a queue in front of me, I will duck off that corridor and rat run through the community. And that 
we believe is the last thing we want. That is uh, what we believe the Environment Court was asking us collectively to avoid. Um, and similarly, uh, that congested nature is not good for emissions in terms of stop-start traffic, having traffic being ma able to be managed and uh, moving through the corridor. Uh, we do strongly support uh, public transport priority and that can be incorporated into a clear way design uh, through that corridor. So uh, in, in summary, I mean, we believe that the proposal that you uh, have before you may contravene that Environment Court consent requirement. And we do encourage Council to carefully consider that recommendation for you today. And we do request further discussion directly with Waka Kotahi, given our partnership and co-investment um, position. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you, that was really good. Um, do you um, appreciate that the council has already implemented the um, rat running mitigation in that area through the surrounding streets? So would that then alter your view of encouraging rat running? Uh, because it's not possible anymore. Uh, no, in, in isolation, I don't believe that will. I mean, I, I cycle home every day through Collins Street, through the Addington community there, and there is a number of traffic calming measures through that. But I regularly see traffic uh, rat running through that neighbourhood. And as much as we like to think that some calming measures will make them stay away, I believe uh, that it's far better for us to manage the, our uh, arterial corridors appropriately. This is not about providing um, unabated capacity for single occupant vehicles. It's just about enabling the traffic that is there uh, to flow appropriately and then we can prioritise the modes um, as necessary through those corridors. So on its own, the, the calming measures I don't believe would uh, mitigate the Environment Court's concerns. And what about your view on the fact that if um, people do find um, this is getting congested through that from Innes Road to Berwick, that they may be encouraged to take the bus rather than providing a clear way and enabling them to bring their car, which is actually contrary to the GPS. Uh, yes, uh, the, the key bus corridor is down Main North Road and Papua Nui Road, and if for people who can access that corridor um, effectively, there is a good mode transfer option for them. Um, you need to think about that. The buses in this corridor, the section between uh, what is the Cranford Street roundabout in the new configuration through to Innes Road, everybody in that section is going to get held up, including any buses that are in that section as well. Mm -hmm. mm. But the part we're talking about today is south of Innes, between Innes and, and Berwick. Yeah, but my point yeah. is that, that what you do at that critical Innes intersection has an impact further back up into the corridor, which is where the expert witness identified the um, spill off and the diversion of traffic is likely to occur. Mm. And my last question, if I may, is that uh, providing a clear way will actually attract more cars, which means that will hit that 30% increase threshold a lot earlier. Do you have a comment on that? Uh, I don't. It, it will manage the, the traffic that is in there. Um, the, it will not be such a great level of service that uh, it will attract more cars per se. It is about managing the cars that are in, the, in that corridor. And as I mentioned, I mean, the Clearway can facilitate buses, so therefore we are providing that mode choice option, which is what we're all collectively trying to achieve. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Aaron. Yeah, j just with your points around the um, uh, Environment Court and also uh, the um, agreement with the NZTA, is there any consequences of going against that? Or can we just kind of do it and you get told you shouldn't have done that, but that's it? Uh, I'm sure there are consequences and I'm sure your uh, council officers can advise you on the significance of that uh, more appropriately than I can. I think that you've got a, a meeting with staff this morning um, to take this further, is that right? Oh, right. Okay. All right. Well, we shall, we'll, we'll be considering the paper later in the afternoon. Yes, Thanks right. very much. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, Environment Canterbury. Uh, 
Councillor Phil Clearwater and Edward Riot. Morena, Leanne and councillors. Um, apologies from, from Chair Jenny Huey. She has um, long-term plan matters she had to attend to today, so you've got me um, and Edward Wright. So, um, look, Environment Canterbury, uh, we're asking council to decide on the option for the bus lanes at peak travel times only. Um, and just to make that clear how that would work, you probably know, but just to reiterate, um, in, in the morning time on Cranford Street, um, that bus lane uh, it would operate as a lane only between six o'clock until nine o'clock in the morning, and starting at six to to, uh, to allow the direct service from Waimakariri. Um, on the on the south on the southbound lane, and in the afternoon for the north for the northbound travel, um, the times for the bus lane would be say between three o'clock and six o'clock. So the bus lane on Cranford Street would work really just like other bus lanes on the busy um, streets and roads in, in Christchurch where um, the bus lanes, where we have them work very well. The, um, also the peak travel um, bus lanes, they support not only um, the direct services which are being launched um, for Waimakariri, um, and me, Dan Gordon I'm sure will speak about that, that soon, but also the bus service for Route 28 and that travels on Cranford Street and serves the local community. And although the report refers to um, the Cranford Street corridor having um, only limited bus service or occasional bus service, and I want to speak about that, because the number of buses using Cranford Street w uh, when the express buses come online, as well as Route 28, will be seven buses each hour, or one every 15 minutes. Now that may not sound a lot, however, in fact, the, the num that number of buses using Cranford Street would be the same as the streets um, and roads where we've already got um, bus lanes throughout the city, and there are numerous examples that you'll be aware of. Um, and although um, Route 28 um, is currently has a frequency of just every 20 minutes, um, councils will be aware through the, the Public Transport Futures business case which will go to central government, that there'll be an increase in the frequency of the service for that um, metro city connecting route. So while um, we understand the idea um, about waiting and seeing what the traffic volumes are going to look like, if there's significant congestion when this corridor opens or, or soon after, this would then have a huge impact on both the new direct services from Waimakariri and Route 28. And it could certainly put people off from using these services, and it would be, be much harder to attract them back after such neg negative initial experiences. Duncan Webb uh, referred to climate change, and regarding climate change, I want to say that the report says that the option to undertake traffic monitoring will likely have limited impact on vehicle emissions. However, that's really an acknowledgement that it will not even start to address the fact that 53% of Christchurch's carbon emissions are due to tra air transport and largely due to single occupancy cars. So councillors will be aware that our current reliance on private vehicles is not sustainable long term. And travel demand on the Cranford Street corridor will only intensify. So support for the public transport infrastructure is actually vital to accommodate the increasing demand on Greater Christchurch's transport network. So today I'm asking you as councillors to support the part-time bus lanes option. That'll be before you later. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for Phil? Um, Melanie. When you see express bus meant to start, I know it's meant to be after the arterial opens, but have you got a date? We, we do. Um, January the 11th. All oh, right, specific. <coughs> Very good, thank you. To be precise. Coming soon. Um, Aaron? Yeah, just um, after some numbers, Phil, what are the, what's the current bus usership or usage from Waimakariri? We've yet to begin the, the, um, direct, the direct express service, 
Yeah. Okay. Well, how many people in my Makariri currently catch the bus, not in their district, because that would be low, but from coming to town versus... Unfortunately, yeah. that's a detail I can't answer off the top of my head. Um, right. But there is significant usage uh, in, in bus services from the Waimakariri district. That's both urban and school buses um, that in the mornings. I, yeah, I think those, those use Papua yeah. Nui Road currently and, and yeah. do things like serve schools on Papua Nui Road. These new express services will be complementary to that and really focused on central city workers. So, get, well, hopefully those numbers do exist on what currently is, but also a best case scenario model, like if there was express buses, uh, there was park and ride, buses were free, um, they were more often, like the absolute utopian world of buses, well, how many people would be on them would be um, a really good number to see, so we can kind of compare. Um, because uh, certainly the most hope in the St Albans area is around bus usage. Uh, I, I think myself, e-bikes, um, so a lever we're not pulling enough, but um, it would be good if those numbers do exist, if we could see them. Uh, Pauline? Yeah, thank you, and thank you very much for coming in. Um, and thank you, I'd like to thank you for actually taking the bold step and putting this express bus through from Waimakariri and Rangiora and Kaipui um, and I'm just hoping, um, well actually my question is what is ECAN's plan for electrifying the fleet and will these um, buses have Wi-Fi on them? That's uh, the second question first, yes, yes they will have Wi-Fi on them. Right. In Good. terms of electrifying the fleet we currently have three electric buses in Christchurch, by November next year we'll have another 25 wow. and there's ambition to continue growing that in the future. Thank you, because I think that would make these, this route really attractive actually too, if, you, if they could be electric as well. And, and of course, um, as, you're, uh, as you're picking up, Pauline, the electric buses being, being fast and, and quiet, no, no emissions at all, um, certainly we are hoping will be attractive to, potential, to increase potential patronage. Right, and just one more question. Have you thought about um, diverting the bus um, at Edgeware Road to the east? Um, and then taking Manchester straight down into the city, the express. Sorry, do you mean the express route or Route 28? Just the express. Just the express. Well, the express route has flexibility uh, to to move to any road, uh, depending on what's fastest. Its first stop is not till further down Manchester. But it Street. won't rat run, will it? No, it no. won't rat run. <laughs> Okay, that's good. But, that's but it, could, it could peel off at Edgeware Road onto Manchester Street right. if, if that was the appropriate way. It could peel off at uh, Berwick Street and use Madras Street right. if, if that was, sorry, Barbados Street going south, if that was the appropriate way as oh, well. Great. But certainly it would be using the section between Innes Road and Berwick Street, yep. which you're considering today. Yep. Thank you. Mike? Thank you. Actually, Pauline asked all the questions I was going to ask. It's great to um, see your commitment on increasing the frequency for the 28. It would be good if there were electric buses right from the get-go. Um, and I guess another thing is, is how we actually, you know, start off with a great big bang and, and the potential of actually doing a, a period of free PT um, using that express route just to actually get people used to the, the service and actually how well it works could be a good, good option. Um, and I guess the other thing, while I've got you there, um, are you looking at increasing the age of the child fair to 19 as per your um, policy? We're certainly having discussions around um, and a whole review of the fair structure, Mike. And so what you've hit on, certainly uh, a lot of us as councillors, and I speak personally, um, w w would like to see how in fact they, the fares are as affordable as possible, especially for families. Okay. Do, do you know the time frame around that fair review? It's yeah, we're, we're likely to be second half of next year for the, the fair review now, with long-term plan being the, the key considerations for the first half of the year. OK. Wouldn't they, shouldn't that all dovetail together, your long-term plan and the fair review? No. I, um, personally, Mike, I, I agree with you in terms of using all the levers that we have. I understand, though, in fact, there's a lot of, a lot of um, technical workers required for that review. Got 20 seconds, Yanni. Um, thank you. Um, just wanted to check, so you're supportive of the community board recommendations, is that correct? 
No, we, we're supportive that we're really asking council to decide on the option for the bus lanes at peak travel times only, which are my reading wasn't the community board option. Right, okay, so you're supporting option three. Yes. And have you talked to NZTA about supporting that option? Uh, well, we've, there's been a partnership here between uh, Christchurch City Council, Waka Kotahi and, and Waimakariri District. Uh, within that, there's probably divergent options uh, that we, that we uh, like, depending on our particular modes. Um, uh, HOV lanes would also uh, provide good service for, for bus passengers, and a clearway could as well. But uh, it seems to us that the bus lanes are a good option to look at for uh, when the, the HOV, sorry, when the Christchurch yeah. Northern Corridor opens. Thank uh, you. Shortly. And just to be clear, you're not part Thanks. of that. Thanks. Thanks that, very much. The three groups. It's good. We're, we're, we're getting full report back with the report this afternoon. Um, I, I don't know if you heard, but we're, we're going to deal with this matter this afternoon, not straight after the we, we understand that, community yeah. boards. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Thank could you I invite uh, Waimakariri District Council, uh, Mayor Dan Gordon and um, Chief Executive Jim Palmer. Good morning. Good morning and um, welcome. <laughs> good morning, Your Worship. Um, we've got a copy of my uh, submission for each of you. Would you mind, it's okay if we hand it around? Kia ora. Uh, would you like me to start, Your Worship? Thank you. Um, firstly, thank you for the opportunity to be present uh, to the Council today. Uh, with me is our Council Chief Executive, uh, Jim Palmer. I'd like to um, acknowledge Mayor Leanne and Councillor Davidson and Templeton, who ably represent the City at the Greater Christchurch Partnership Table. Um, I have personally been delighted by the progressive and constructive way the partnership has worked during this term of council. Today I'd like to provide some comments in regard to the Cranford Street improvements in this road to Berwick Street that you are considering later in your agenda. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the Papua Nui Innes Community Board and the residents who have submitted on this issue. I note that the Community Board has recommended to the Council that it supports the design proposed by Christchurch City Council staff maintaining the current road alignment along with continuing to monitor traffic movements and effects. This reflects a valid community perspective and I can understand why residents have submitted in this way to their Community Board and also the recommendation from the Board um, who represent their interests. I believe it is equally important for the Council to also consider the proposal from a Greater Christchurch Partnership perspective, particularly in relation to improving public transport and supporting mode shift from single occupancy vehicles to public transport, multi-passenger vehicles and other forms of multimodal transport such as walking and cycling. With the creation of the Christchurch Northern Corridor has not been without issues. The planning for it has been anticipated for more than a decade as part of the wider land use and transport planning for Greater Christchurch. This wider plan has been endorsed by the partners including Christchurch City Council, ECAN, NZTA and Waimakari District Council. I'd like to acknowledge and thank the City Council for the investment it has made to support the significant infrastructure project. 
As a partnership, we have worked hard to develop solutions to implement the strategy, including dedicated express buses, park and ride services, and a dedicated public transport in T2 Lane on the corridor to reduce dependency on cars and support more sustainable transport solutions. The commitment to the Greater Christchurch Partnership. As Greater Christchurch Partners, we are all working towards getting as many people out of single occupancy cars as possible and supporting sustainable transport solutions. The Waimakere District Council has been and is totally supportive of the work of the Greater Christchurch Partnership. The urban development strategy confirmed through that the Our Space process last year has supported the necessary commitments to infrastructure investments and district plan changes to cater for growth anticipated by the UDS. It is worth noting the Greater Christchurch residents work right across the sub-region. Of Waimakariri residents commuting to Christchurch for work, the latest census data shows about 17% are destined for, for inside the four avenues. Waimakariri District Council has allocated $4 million to support park and ride facilities, as well as several million dollars for cycleways to help support mode shift from single <coughs> occupancy vehicles. In the medium to longer term, Waimakariri District Council supports building on and expanding the park and ride services and improving public transport infrastructure as demand increases. There are five park and ride facilities under construction or due for construction in the coming months in Rangiora and Kaiapoi. Direct bus express bus service ex sorry, direct um, bus service express bus services will commence in January 2021 providing a major improvement to the commuter offering, both in terms of frequency and travel time. The Waimakari District Council is fully committed to this initiative and is looking forward to a successful launch of the whole package, along with increasing patronage over time. This is a key initiative to start addressing concerns about increasing traffic volumes using the Northern Corridor and to support commuting into the city on rapid transit buses. Importantly, following consultation by ECAN, the ratepayers in Waimakariri will also be paying up to an additional $30 per household per annum for the express bus service. When combined with the investment the Waimakariri District Council is making, it represents a significant commitment. There is also an accompanying package of travel demand management initiatives planned by the partners to support the high occupancy lane on the Northern Corridor, including messages around rideshare, PT, public transport and other tra travel mode options such as walking and cycling. To make PT more attractive, it needs to be competitive, especially in terms of travel time. The high occupancy lane on the CNC provides this opportunity. However, to get the best benefit, this needs to be supported right along the length of the journey. The perception and reality of unpeated PT flow is vital to encouraging people to swap modes. The current design has the occupancy lane finishing on the CNC north of Cranford Street. We acknowledge that that section of Cranford Street between the CNC and Innes Road has been four-laned to manage the traffic demand in this area. However, there would be a missed opportunity if Cranford Street between Innes Road and Berwick Street is not given further consideration with regard to providing improved travel times for buses and possibly high occupancy vehicles, hence encouraging more use of PT and rideshare. So just reflect now on the, our Council's view on the options in the report. The Waimakari District Council does not support the proposal that has been recommended by the Papua Nui Innes Community Board. The other options presented in the report merit further consideration. Other than reviewing the report before you, we have not had the opportunity to undertake any detailed analysis of the options, nor appreciate uh, how the impact of the relevant corridor consent conditions have been considered as part of the analysis. 
On the face of it, Waimakariri District Council considers that option two, peak hour, peak hour high occupancy vehicle lane, may well be the best long-term solution, aligning this part of the network with the approach being taken on the Northern Corridor. However, initially we appreciate that pursuing option three, peak hour bus only lane, may be more acceptable while still providing a number of benefits over the option recommended by the Community Board. In conclusion, while the recommended approach includes further monitoring, which the Waimakariri District Council does support, we consider that broader Greater Christchurch Partnership objective, objectives should be also taken into account. The Council may want to consider laying this matter on the table to receive further advice and analysis from transport officers of all the relevant partners before it finally makes its decision. Thank you again for the opportunity to present today and we would be happy to answer any questions. This is a minute here, um, Andrew. Thank you very much indeed for the um, deputation and for making your position um, very clear. Um, so option two is your preferred option, but you would find option three acceptable. Given your um, comments around um, mode shift onto PT, um, that surprises me a little bit. Why would you not just go for the bus lane rather than the um, T2 as your preferred option? Well, I think, I think what we're looking to do is if we're encouraging HOV vehicles, then obviously going through the whole way would be desirable. But look, I, I'm a realist politically, and I accept uh, where some of the position may be going. And from our pos position, having a bus lane at, at, at peak times would be more desirable than nothing at all. And, and from our perspective, if that, but if we're to make that change, to see that bus go past you in the morning, it's how you're going to convince people to make that change. Yeah, and yeah. that's why we're making that investment, considerable investment in our district to make that happen. And we've looked at a variety of options, taken a number of studies. We, th we, th we think we're on the right track with that and we'll do our best to encourage our people to make that change. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's much appreciated and um, we appreciate the effort that you've made to come in and present to us. Uh, you may not have heard, but um, we're, we're um, going to deal with this later on this afternoon as there's further advice that we need to take as a result of the deputation. So thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much again. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the last one is in relation to item um, 18, Central City Residential um, Programme Supply, uh, Lindsay Carswell. Wipe my wage for the crowd. <laughs> well, good morning, all. Um, before I actually start, I just want to make a couple of points. This um, submission I've done for you <laughs> was done in quite a bit of a hurry, actually. So, I, if I'd had more time, I might have used a few different words or checked the spelling or other little bits and pieces. Um, and also, I just want to um, advise you that I've, over the last couple of years, I've had quite a lot of eyesight problems, so I find it difficult to actually read. So. I, well, I've got a magnifier, it still doesn't um, help all that much. But anyway, let's get into what I've got here. You'll recall that a few months back um, when you were looking at the, um, the rebate scheme, I did a supply and demand analysis. <coughs> I guess trying to, it, was, it ended up almost at uh, year 13 level when I was teaching economics or seven form level for bursary and scholarship economics and I guess Trying to do a week's work in five minutes was pushing it a little bit. You know, I don't think most of you really understood what I was actually trying to get at there. But what I was tr trying to point out to you is that the subsidy to the developer ends up in the developer's hands. It does not end up in the purchaser of the unit or the house in the central city. Very little of that subsidy goes to the purchaser. It goes to the developer, it goes into his profits, or it may pay for some of the costs, we'll never know. So that's the first thing I want to say. But the point that I notice, though, in this item 18 is this view is still persisting in that report, that 
the contribution goes to the purchaser. If you have a look through the agenda item, which I had to read through a couple of times, um, page 234, it's got there, assuming that the savings are re reflected in the sale price, price drops. Um, page 245, supply side is going on about there, the savings and development, etc., etc., <coughs> and so on. You've probably read the report anyway, and you would have come across those. Well, I hope you've read the report. Anyway, <clears throat> after I spoke about the development contributions previously in June, I sent an email to the council and asked, well, how does this actually work? What is the mechanism that it ends up in the hands of the um, purchaser? And I got an email back from council under Dawn Baxendale's name, office under her email. The email wasn't signed off by anybody, so I don't know who actually wrote it. But anyway, <clears throat> it goes on to say, um, was I've written out there, <clears throat> and you would have read that. But I, so what it's saying is, it's not true that the developer passes on the rebate to the purchaser. Now, if it were true, then there would be a mechanism, some means for that money to go to the purchaser. It doesn't happen. <clears throat> the agenda of item 18 is signed on that point. It doesn't say, just makes a bland statement. Let's move on a bit. Let's have a look at some supply factors. I do not believe that the cost structure of building in the inner city differs much from building in the other suburbs around the central city area. <clears throat> uh, an examination of William Corporation. Now, the figures I've taken here are straight off their website. I'm using their design because they're, they use a cookie cutter approach to building. They build the same thing everywhere. So you can do a comparison throughout the city where they've been building. And if you look carefully, you'll find that what they've built in the central city and what they've built in the suburbs, price-wise, there's very little difference. There's a range of prices, I know, and a range of prices in the central city and a range of prices round. But the prices don't reflect that there's a price problem in the central city area. <clears throat> In my view, the rebate is just adding to the profit of the developer. Totally waste of money, as far as the council is concerned, as far as our rates are concerned. Let's have a look at some demand factors. I'd just like to mention just one, which I believe hasn't been looked at, and I believe it's actually the elephant in the room. And that is that over the last 50 odd years, Christchurch City has become a homogenised city. You've got shopping, housing everywhere, scattered throughout the whole city. Look how many shopping malls we've got. With dozens of them. People no longer have to come into the central city to work or to shop. So the demand for central city housing and business space, in fact, has declined. And that's the problem. It's taken 50 years. You've achieved it. You go to Dunedin, they don't allow it. There are no shopping malls in Dunedin except in the central city. And I'd be wanting to say, I do not believe, apart from Auckland, that any city is as homogenised like we are. All right. I'm not going to take up much time. Conclusion. A couple of points I just want to make here. Um, it's clear that the council is not certain who gains from the, the DC rebate. I would strongly urge, I plead with you, go back and reconsider that decision you did in June. You have squandered so far 13 million, you're going to squander another 7 million on it. 
It is a waste of money. But thank Get you, it. Lindsay. We don't have that item on our agenda. No, today. I know, but and I'm just urging the, you to do sorry, that. Sorry, I've been very gracious in terms okay. of the deputations. So All right, in my you. view, final note, my view, the lack of uptake in the housing in the inner city is due to planning decisions that have made over the last 50 odd years. Homeowners and businesses have abandoned the central city for the suburbs. I don't know how you're going to get them back. And that's all I want to say. That's lovely. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Uh, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is.